okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to our session. Uh, I hope everyone is having a great KubeCon so far. So yeah, let's get started. Uh, so today our topic is about uh, introduction to Cortex, multi-tenant scalable uh, Prometheus. So uh, I'm Ben Ye. Uh, I'm a software uh, development engineer at AWS, and uh, uh, I'm a maintainer of Cortex as well as Sanos project. And I'm also a contributor to some other CNCF project like Prometheus, Argo CD, etc. So I have a puppy named uh, Gui, and uh, yeah, so today with me I have uh, yeah. I have Fredrik. Yeah, I have um, Fredrik Gonzalez. Um, I'm a software engineer at Adobe. Um, I'm also a maintainer for Cortex. And what you see there is my puppy. Uh, well, she's not a puppy anymore. She's Doberman. So um, I just want to excuse myself. We in the last year presentation we had more puppies. This year doesn't have that many. I'm sorry for that. But um, so, but what is Cortex? Um, Let's talk a bit on Cortex. Cortex is a horizontally scalable, highly available multi-tenant long-term storage for Prometheus. Um, it's a community project. It was created in 2000, 2016. It's part of the CNCF incubating projects. It has seen a lot of contributors. Uh, it has had a lot of maintainers over the years. Um, these are the companies using Cortex um, or, or that had used Cortex. Um, but I want to stop right here a bit. Um, who's familiar with Prometheus? Can you raise your hand? Great. And who's familiar with collectors, open telemetry collectors? Anybody running out? Great. OK, awesome. Well, back in when 2016, uh, when Cortex was created and started to work on, we had this situation with Prometheus that, as you might be familiar with it, it is a memory database, right? So the more metrics you you add to a Prometheus, it, uh, it starts to increase in resources needs, right? So it needs more memory. Um, so typically set up. Uh, what people do, they have more than one Prometheus, right? They have two Prometheus now. Uh, just one Prometheus for some applications, one Prometheus for another application, and uh, you solve your problem. But uh, this problem increases, and now you have several Prometheus, and now your view of the metrics starts to become a little bit different, right? You have metrics, some he metrics here, some metrics there, uh, and this is when most people use Thanos, right? They have like uh, Thanos deployed that is able to see if you're familiar with Thanos. Um, I'm just throwing out that, that if you're familiar. Uh, and, and it's able to see all the views. The thing with Thanos though is, is you have to configure it. You have to decide where to put every metric. Uh, that's how um, Thanos solves that problem. But uh, what does Cortex does different, right? Cortex is an API. Um, and this API is able to receive the metrics from all your Prometheus, right? And it's able to handle all the cardinality, all the metrics that require that uh, your Prometheus are generating. And it's handling all the, the problems. I'm going to go in deep detail on how that works in the future. But I want to mention that uh, we also have now in part of the C CNCF ecosystem is the open telemetry, right? Open telemetry is something newer than Cortex. It came later. Um, and most people are using it nowadays to get signals, uh, log signals, trace signals, metric signals. When Open Telemetry Collector came out, um, it was already ready to be used uh, for Cortex. Um, so you typically run not just one collector, but you, but you run many collectors. And you can use the collectors uh, with Cortex. You can send all those metrics to Cortex uh, using uh, to, uh, those collectors, but it doesn't really end there. Um, suppose something else it was invented, and in the future that we don't know, that could also be used to send those metrics to the same API because it's an API basically. Uh, so, what are the Cortex uh, key features? What is behind Cortex is that it's able to do true horizontal scaling. And you don't need to reconfigure Cortex if you need more cardinality or if you need more active series. It's just uh, increasing uh, replicas in some um, 
some deployment or some stateful set. Um, the other thing that Cortex has is the multi-tenancy. From the beginning, uh, Cortex had support for multi-tenants, so you can send uh, metrics to different places and your tenants are separated, completely separated inside Cortex. Um, and that is as a key feature of Cortex. Also in Cortex, is a, uh, from the beginning, was able to do faster querying because it provides a query cache layer. And that cache layer is able to help you out uh, makes most of the qu queries faster. Also because it's, it can horizontally scale. Those uh, limits that I just mentioned that you can use, uh, sorry, the, the limits that you, the, the tenants that you, that you just mentioned, you can configure per tenant limits, not just for all the teams, you can also say this every team, how many resources it requires. So in the scenario that I explained before, where you have uh, some metrics increasing, uh, not, all the, not all the tenants are affected, but only the ones that are generating the metrics specific to those. And last but not least, um, additionally to the typical Prometheus API, Cortex provides a rich API for managing alerts and rules. So you can uh, create all your rules in, in Cortex. Um, but um, how does this look on the inside? So in the inside of Cortex, behind this API, we have this architecture. Um, the architecture starts in the middle when you see the remote write. Uh, the remote write box, you, you have all your agents. Here you see Prometheus. Um, and Prometheus is remote writing to the distributors. The distributors take care of distributing the, the samples over to the ingesters. Uh, it does that by using the replication factor of three. That means uh, all the metrics that get written to Cortex get written to uh, three ingesters uh, at the same time. And that is allows to not have problems if, for example, some ingesters fail at some point, right? Um, the ingesters at the same time, they take care of compacting those metrics. And at the end, after two hours, they ship to S3 or any kind of block storage that you might have. Um, on the right side, um, you have uh, a typical dashboard tool and it's using the Cortex API for query. In this case, you have a query front end, which is receiving those queries and sending those over to the query couriers, which are in charge of getting those metrics out of the ingesters and also getting those, the same metrics out of uh, the storage if those queries are uh, long term. Uh, in the mix, also the store gateways out the, there to download the TSD, TSDB blocks from from S3 and making them available for querying in Cortex. Uh, part of the query layer is also, as you can see, the, the result cache and also the index cache, which uh, allows for uh, faster querying. And on the left side, um, we have the Alert Manager API, which is what I mentioned around receiving and managing uh, those alerts and rules for each tenant. Um, if you are familiar with Thanos till this point, you might be <laughs> seeing some resemblance. And there's no uh, resemblance to Thanos. Uh, and the reason for that is because Cortex and Thanos collaborate a lot in and, and, and the way it works, uh, sorry, in the way it's built. Um, and we also collaborate with Prometheus and uh, because we use the same, basically the same code base as Prometheus uh, for most of the features. Um, we do contribute back. Uh, the Cortex project creates a lot of new features, and one of those features that was recently created was the PromptQL Smith, which is uh, a project that lets you um, find bugs in, in the query uh, in queriers. This library was used um, in the tan new Thanos IO PromptQL engine and was able to find more than 10 bugs in that, in that repo. Um, but what are the new features in this year in Cortex? Uh, back to you, Ben. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Fredrich. So uh, I will go and talk about uh, so what's new features we added since last uh, KubeCon uh, to Cortex. So uh, Cortex 1.13 uh, was released uh, last November. And uh, we implemented some uh, important features. And uh, we also value uh, operator uh, experience. So our main focus is still uh, reducing operator pains, as well as uh, improving the scalability and the scalability of our Cortex. So next, I will go and talk about some uh, new features and enhancements uh, we release uh, in this release and uh, the upcoming uh, 1.13 release as well. 
so the first one I want to talk about is called dynamic tenant shard size. And uh, it's a feature mainly works in the query pass. So uh, before that, I want to uh, emphasize how query pass works. So we have mainly three components, query front end, uh, query scheduler, and querier. So the query requests uh, goes into query front end, and the query front end does some kind of uh, result caching and splitting, and it basically uh, puts the query requests uh, into a query scheduler, which is basically a queue of your queries. And uh, we have query uh, basically working as a workers, which uh, pulls uh, the query jobs from a scheduler queue and then uh, executes those queries against the storage nodes. So uh, with shuffle sharding enabled, then uh, each tenant can be assigned to uh, a, a number of queries in this case. So for example, um, a tenant has two queries, and each query uh, is configured with a limited number of concurrency. So in this case, uh, each query uh, has four uh, queries lost, which means uh, at the same time, it can execute four queries uh, uh, in this single query instance. So this works because it helps uh, protect Umkill for the query part. And uh, so in this kind of setup, um, basically uh, if a, a tenant has two queries, it can run eight queries uh, at the same time. And the more queries uh, it has, the more queries it can process. So uh, with this kind of background, let's take a look at the, this feature. So we have a, maybe a very small uh, Cortex cluster setup with four queries, and we have three tenants uh, configured. And each tenant, we have this kind of uh, runtime configuration called max queries per tenant, which is basically the query shard size. And each tenant has two, which means uh, they got two queries assigned. So because of the shuffle sharding, you can see some queries uh, are shared uh, between different tenants. So, um, so this is the initial setup, but let's say uh, we have HPA configured uh, in Cortex cluster, which is quite common because sometimes we want to dynamically scale up uh, our replicas based on some conditions. For example, uh, if CPU memory or even maybe bandwidth usage exceeds some uh, percentage, then uh, HPA kicks in and uh, more queries got scaled up. Uh, the problem is that even though we scale up more query replicas, uh, the runtime configuration for each tenant is still two. It's still a static number. So um, with dynamic tenant shard size configuration, um, what we can achieve is that we can configure um, the value to be a percentage uh, of the total number of replicas. So in this case, if we configure uh, this number to 0.5, which means after HPA kicks in, uh, the tenant shard size will be automatically uh, increased uh, from two to four in this case, so that different tenants, they can basically utilize the new replicas um, uh, scale up by HPA. So this feature also works for store gateway, not only uh, in query. So next, uh, let's talk about another feature we implement to reduce operator pain. So this is a, a Cortex component called Query, oh sorry, called Ruler. Uh, what it does is that it evaluates uh, alerting and recording rules against Cortex storage layer, which is uh, ingester and store gateway. So um, for some users, they might configure um, like some rules, which fetch a lot of data and uh, they have no idea whether their rules succeeds or not, and they don't care about it, they just leave it here. So for those kind of rules, I think Cortex already have uh, very good uh, query limits to protect query and the storage component. So for this rule, maybe uh, it will hit some query limits for our storage and return 422 and stop evaluating the query even more. Or uh, if it gets lucky, and uh, it do, uh, doesn't hit any limit on our storage, but it might fail at uh, ruler evaluation time. But the worst case is that uh, uh, it doesn't hit, hit any limits, and the ruler just uh, the rule just uh, got evaluated, and eventually it timeout. So in this case, 
the rule just runs uh, continuously, but it never succeeds. So this might not be a big problem, but uh, when you have other queries at the same time, and uh, your storage might get overwhelmed, so it's hard to run other queries, and it might impact availability, uh, maybe all for, for your other queries, and maybe for all the tenants in, in the Cortex cluster. So yeah, basically, uh, we are in, in fire. So uh, this feature is Basically, we allow to configure uh, a number of uh, rule groups for each tenant, and you can just disable it so that you can stop it uh, from being uh, executed. So, um, yeah, next one is also something um, kind. I like really like this feature. It's called query priority. So, as we uh, discussed, Cortex is designed to be a multi-tenant system, so it works well and. Uh, its main goal is to reduce blast radius and uh, to avoid one tenant to be impacted by some uh, by queries from other tenants. But uh, one interesting problem is that we can have some kind of risk condition or con um, some kind of um, this issue within a single tenant. For example, a single tenant might have different query uh, patterns. Let's say they have ad hoc queries and which might be some long trending queries. They are very expensive to evaluate and very slow and might even hit some limits. And they might also have some other queries like health check or probing queries, which runs very fast. Um, but it's more important because maybe if this query failed, it will trigger some alarm and uh, operator got paged. So, um, as I mentioned before, there's a, there, there's a queue uh, in Query Scheduler, and it's basically a FIFO queue. So first in, first out. So for example, um, if some user runs uh, some ad hoc queries, which are long trending, and those queries, they just fit in, into the queue, and uh, the health track or probing queries they arrive later, and in this case, they are wait uh, at the end of the queue. So what will happen in this case? So maybe um, if there are too many uh, long trending or ad hoc queries, maybe they will cause a queue to be full. And in this case, the health check queries will just be rejected because uh, queue, queue is full in this case. And uh, another situation is that the queue um, doesn't full, and, but the problem is that they are just waiting in the queue to be picked up by querier. But querier has only limited capacity and uh, concurrency as well if we don't uh, dynamically scale up queries. So because those long trending queries are very expensive and slow, and maybe those important queries, they never get executed uh, until they time out in the queue. So how we solve this? And the problem here is that we actually have a queue, but the queue is actually ordered by the in-queue time. So what we can do is that we can have a uh, a, a, the same 5 queue, but it's ordered by uh, priority. So we introduce a configuration called query priority, and it works pretty neat because you can define a default priority, and you can define some other priority you want, and uh, maybe you can use some rejects or time window to match a specific query or uh, maybe within some kind of specific time range, for example, recent two hours and uh, you want this query to be higher priority than the default one, and uh, in, so that it can be picked up earlier by a uh, query. And also there's a new configuration called reserved queries, which you can maybe utilize one query to serve this type of uh, query only. And uh, even though it might be kind of wasteful for some kind of concurrency slots, but it ensures like um, this query should be executed successfully. Um, so next in, uh, improvement is called multi-level index cache. So this is how it works right now and it's used in the store, store gateway component. So basically store gateway can uh, query a remote cache, maybe it's memcached. If there's a cache miss, it will go to the uh, bucket backend, maybe S3 in this case. And uh, this pattern works pre pretty well, but the problem is that uh, all the query and all the data you need to fetch, they have to go over the network. So for index, um, 
it can be a very problematic sometimes because those postings can be very large uh, in your uh, time series database block. So uh, an improvement we did is to add another layer, which is an in-memory uh, LRU cache. And it's the same process in, in Store Gateway. And uh, it, it, Store Gateway will try to fetch from in-memory client first, then go to the second layer of memcached. So and this pattern uh, works pretty well, actually, because um, usually the queries go to Store Gateways have the same kind of pattern, the same kind of matchers. So the hit rate uh, of the in-memory cache uh, is usually very high. So uh, it itself, maybe it can handle maybe 90% of requests. So this helps us a lot in terms of bandwidth. And with multi-level index cache, you can do something more advanced with a new feature uh, added in Sanos called filtered index cache. So there are actually three types of index items. Um, uh, posting series and expanded postings. So expanded posting is actually the intersection uh, of the postings for your query, and the size is usually much smaller um, than the actual postings. So um, storing expanded postings is usually more efficient and for some kind of limited capacity scenario, especially maybe in memory usage. Uh, so let's say you have only one gigabytes of in memory cache, and uh, you can maybe store maybe 10K expanded postings items, but for postings, you can only store maybe 100. So it increases um, the hit ratio as well as reducing the evictions. And the second layer, we can have memcached, uh, which stores maybe series and expanded postings. And maybe the third layer, we can have another memcached cluster, but with different configuration. So you can maybe configure it with uh, e uh, external store or actually I don't know how, how it's called, but it basically allows you to store items in disk so that even though like you trade off some kind of uh, query performance, but uh, it actually allows uh, larger capacity to store more cached items. So it probably has better performance than uh, fetching from S3. Uh, while working on the multi-level cache, uh, the, another improvement we did is to improve the in-memory LRU cache. So the caching cortex is actually the same as the one uh, in the tunnels library, which only uses one single uh, lock to read and write all the items. So we noticed that the performance can be very poor under very uh, high concurrency environment. So what we did is that it's quite simple. We just use some kind of bucketized um, script cache so that uh, we can have multiple logs to handle different items so that the performance is much better than before. So we also have some other amazing PRs. We don't have time to go through all of them. I just want to show and thanks for all the contributors to help contribute to make Cortex more stable. Yeah, maybe we have to go to the demo. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we have some new features. Uh, we are in, pro in, in progress. Partition compactor, we have a PR, and also we have uh, native histogram, oh sorry, native histogram and OTLP uh, ingestion. So this is what we are going to demo today. So uh, yeah, I will hand over to yeah. Frederich. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> funny too. So I put out this demo um, recently, it's very simple. It's just uh, extending uh, this example, open telemetry, you can reuse it. You can... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, again, so I, I have this demo that I created very recently. It's just using the the open telemetry um, uh, the open telemetry example here, and uh, you can try it yourself. Uh, I'm going to show it really quick. Uh, so um, not going to go over the details of in, of the inside, but basically it runs uh, Cortex. Uh, let me just cut the script really quick. <sighs> Uh, basically, it just runs a Cortex image. It's not, it's not yet merged, uh, this feature, but it basically is going to run a Cortex image, and, and you can see the last line is just setting up the, the OTLP endpoint, which is uh, it's just telling the application where to send the metrics. That's all you have to do. There's no, there's no remote write in this setup, right? Um, and I'm just going to run it, uh, which is Cortex. Uh, 
Grand Cortex here. You want to do it? <laughs> Good. Right. So um, when we do this, uh, the application is running and it's supposed to start sending uh, the samples. It's configured to be a sample of every 10 seconds. And we're going to see in, uh, in the logs that is starting to send. So I, I just posted also the samples that I'm sending to Cortex and the logs as well. So we're going to move over to the application. This application is basically an endpoint. So you just hit that endpoint and you get a roll dice. Um, you get multiple. You can send as many requests from this. And uh, if we move over to Grafana, which already has a pre-configured data source pointing to that cortex, it should have the metrics. Let's click here. Yeah, it did work. Right, so these are open telemetry met metrics in Cortex. Um, um, yeah, I don't have anything. Uh, go back to you, the demo. Yeah, uh, I'm going to quickly show a native histogram demo. So what I have is that I have an application exposing a native histogram metrics. So I'm going to quickly show that. So there's an application which exposes uh, histogram implemented by native histogram. So, and I have a Docker Compose setup, which uh, have Prometheus and data to Cortex. So, I'm gonna quickly run it. Cool. And uh, let's go to Grafana. Oh, actually. So, it should be, yep, we should be able to see it. Oh, yeah, actually this one. So we can see um, the native Instagram instrument uh, ingested correctly. And uh, let's try to run a query. So yeah, I think it works. So if you are familiar with native histogram, you will notice that it can run this query uh, successfully without doing this kind of sum by uh, LE, which is required by the classical uh, histogram uh, in Prometheus. Yeah, yeah, I think that's all for uh, our demo. So, yeah, let's go back to our last slide. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining our session. So, we have our GitHub handles and uh, maybe Twitter handles here as well. So, feel free to talk to us if you have any questions. And, uh, yeah, we are looking for maybe um, help for, for the Cortex uh, project. And feel free to contact us uh, on Slack channel or uh, anywhere. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I think we have two minutes for questions. Any questions? Can you get the mic? <clears throat> Hello, thank you for your speaking. Um, I just have one question about uh, the in-memory LRU that you've implemented. Um, does it mean that um, uh, now we have to be careful ab about the memory uh, usage uh, of the application mainly? Uh, this is my first question. And the second one, uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, I'm really confused because uh, I, I was, I, 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 I don't know if, um, what is the main difference with Thanos and <laughs> Cortex? Because if we want to implement uh, a solution, uh, which one, since the code is almost the same, uh, which, one, uh, which one should fit um, our needs? So, yeah, just... Uh... Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I think the first question is that whether the application can get maybe memory usage issue when we have the in-memory cache. So, I think it's something you can configure. So, you can configure the max size of your index cache, oh, sorry, in-memory index cache. Uh, in my case, maybe it's one gigabyte, and you can also configure the max allowed size of the item. 
so maybe it's uh, maybe 10 megabytes or something. So the memory usage should be under control, yeah, based on your setting. And the second question is about maybe the difference between Cortex and uh, Thanos. So I think nowadays these two projects are kind of very similar, but at the beginning, they come from maybe different um, use cases. Uh, Cortex at the beginning is for multi-tenant and also uh, remote write based. And Thanos at the beginning is mainly sidecar based uh, in order to address the federation issue uh, in Prometheus. And, uh, but the, these two projects keeps evolving and Thanos has a, a receiver mode which basically quite similar to Cortex and Cortex has the long-term storage which you use Thanos code to have the compactor and bucket storage. So nowadays, like based on your um, use case, you can choose maybe any of them. But I would say um, if you are uh, maybe a small scale or you doesn't need some kind of uh, multi-tenancy or limit control feature, maybe Sanos works well. But uh, if you manage uh, maybe a platform team that you want to provide service to different um, sub teams and you want to have limits in place um, and, and maybe better multi-tenancy feature, you can choose Cortex. Is, is that answer the question? Yeah, awesome. Um, all over time. I think one question. One question more. One more question. It's probably a tricky one. What's the limitation of Cortex? For example, uh, what's the maximum amount of data that I can store in uh, Cortex? Uh, I can take I can take the uh, first part. Um, I haven't found any. <laughs> so to the really? sizes that I am, I haven't found yet that place. And but I know there are limits. There are limits because I've started to see in the compactor some issues. Some we've seen in before. Some issues with Active Series there. Those issues have been tackled to a degree. Uh, but like. Building an active series is probably uh, a lot for a single tenant, I would say. And I, I mean, not, I think the problems I need to be specific is not most of the problems that I see in terms of scaling Cortex are around the query part more than the ingestion part. The ingestion part kind of like works, but when it comes back to the query part, it becomes harder to get those samples out. And even if you get the samples out, sometimes you get the samples out and the dashboarding tool just fails. So one of the things that I found is really important when you're thinking about high cardinality is like if, it, if it's really useful for you. And uh, so one of uh, my approach, personal approach, and also the, the, the team that I work with is that we always uh, try to see the usability of it if it's really necessary more than if it's possible. So that's why probably I haven't reached a point where I need it. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Good, that was it. Thank you. <laughs>